God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and that is the greatest gift that has ever been given. That is the gift of Christmas. That is the purpose and the reason why we celebrate. That's why we're here to worship, because Jesus Christ was given. God himself came in human form and made himself known to us. How many of you have ever been at a Christmas gathering where the child's opening up presents, and then they finish opening up their presents, and they say, is there another one? How many of you were that child? You don't have to. <laughs> Christmas is about Jesus Christ. And here's the fact is that we do not deserve the gift of Christmas. In fact, we don't deserve any of the gifts that people give us. They're given because somebody hopefully cares rather than given because, well, you have to give me that. Don't you really dislike it when somebody says, well, you need to do this for me? You have to do this for me? I mean, do you really want get to a, get a gift that somebody says, okay, I want you to go buy it, this gift at this location. Here's how much it costs, and it's because that's what I want, and you always make bad choices, so go buy this one. It doesn't work too well, does it, guys, if that happens from your bride or if it happens from somebody else? Jesus is a, the incredible gift of Christmas. And here's the fact, we do not deserve him. And nothing that we do can earn him. It's he has been given out of an act of love by God. He came because he loved us purely and only for that. Romans 5 says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And he goes on, verse 5, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. The greatest gift, that's what we're going to be looking at as we go through this season. We want to continue to look at that. It's the, the title of this series is The Greatest Gift. The greatest gift is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's gift to us. And notice how he says it. When we were still powerless, Christ died for us. First John says it kind of this way. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. If you're wanting to know where I'm right reading this from, it's 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. By this, the love of God was manifested in or among us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation what? To take care of, to remove, to meet all the requirements, the demands, the judgment of our sin. He takes it on himself. How does Romans say it? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus said it this way in John 5, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life, John 5, 24. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, verse 5 of Romans 5 who has been given to us, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He begins this passage, Paul does, by saying, because you're justified. What does it mean to be justified? I'm sure most of you have heard justified stands for just as if I'd never sinned. God is gonna treat us just as if we've never sinned. Newell, in his uh, commentary on the passage, emphasizes an important understanding of what it means to be justified and the tense that is used in this text. I'm going to just quote from Newell in, in his writings where he says, we must note at once that the Greek form of this verb declared righteous, <coughs> justified, 
is not the present participle. What's a present participle? This is not an English lesson, so I'll explain. It means being declared righteous, but rather the aorist principle. This is a different kind of a verb. It says having been declared righteous or justified. You say, so what's the difference, Pastor Bill, right? Okay, the answer is being declared righteous looks to a state you are in. Having been declared righteous looks back to something that's already happened. Present tense, if it's present tense, okay, we're in the process of being justified. No, no, we're in the process of being what? Cleaned up. Long word for that, sanctified. But justification means we have been already determined to be now without sin. Being in a justified state, of course, is incorrect, Newell goes on to say, confusing as it does, justification and sanctification. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. The moment you believed, God declared you righteous, never to change his mind. Romans 8, 4, 8 says, blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will not count against them. So if you're a believer, then quote this verse. Having been declared righteous on the principle of faith, I have these blessed fruits and results which are now to be recorded. You have been justified if you've accepted what Jesus did for you on the cross. If you've accepted the gift of Christmas, you have been taken care of, justified. What does that mean? That means that even though you sin and have sinned and will sin again, and some of you have addictive kinds of things that you do and shame that goes along with that, that Jesus has already paid the price of that sin and looks at you as forgiven. Now see, that's a good thing, isn't it? Because if we're not forgiven, we're still in the process, then we're still sitting here embarrassed, ashamed, feeling guilty and hurting. Now, I realize that that's kind of true anyways, isn't it? That some of us are sitting here embarrassed, ashamed, feeling guilty. And Jesus is saying, but you need to understand that my gift took care of that. It paid the price. And as I look at you, I look at you as justified. I look at you as if there is no sin there. I've removed it. I paid for it. I bled and died for it to set you free from it. God's gift justified us, but God's gift also gives us peace. Now, that's interesting, the phrase that Jesus uses, excuse me, that Paul uses here in this text in Romans. He says, because of Christ, we have peace with God. Now, that's not about contentment. This is a different word for peace. It's not the word where, you know, okay, I just feel happy, or I feel at rest. This is about being glued back together. This is a word for being put together. It's a relational term. It's about being separated from somebody, broken and alienated from them, distant from them, maybe even an enemy from them. And look at what Jesus does. He glues us back together to God. He puts us back into relationship with God. <clears throat> this is peace with God, it's the word erene, if you know the Greek at all. It, it means to bind something together that has been separated. Have you ever come back to somebody that you have done something to hurt them? If you're married, you know what this feels like, okay? You did something, you said something that messed up the other person, that hurt the other person, and you came back and you said you're sorry. I gotta tell you, some of my most favorite times are after a fight with Debbie. I should say, when after. After we've come back together. <laughs> okay? So, I know, she's still got tears on her cheeks, and you know, and, and there's still all that pain. To, but, but it's the coming back together that gives both of us that real sense of what love is. That real sense of peace. No, that's not there when we're fighting. And I know you all know it's always Bill's fault, not Debbie's, okay? <laughs> but God brings us back together in Jesus Christ. And here's the incredible thing, is, is that we were created to be connected to God himself. We were created to have relationship with him. 
And because of Jesus Christ, we get to come back into that relationship. Just like when Debbie and I come back together for after some kind of an argument. God puts us back together with himself, though we've been separated from him. <clears throat> In uh, the Middletown Bible, it says the hostility that once existed between me and God is now gone forever. The war is over. I'm at peace with my creator, and I have full acceptance with him. My acceptance has nothing to do with who I am or what I have done. It has everything to do with who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Some of you remember there was a sign that was over Auschwitz, the German concentration camp where Jews and Christians were put in prison and oftentimes lost their lives there. The same sign hung over da Dachau as well. And the sign was Arbeit macht frei. Arbeit macht frei. Work makes free. Folks, that was a lie. They would work hard and they would get as much out of the people until it killed them. Either in the gas chamber or simply out on the, wherever they were working in the quarries or wherever. And it's also a lie that the world tries to give us as well. That somehow you can work to be good enough to make it into heaven. It's, it's such a false thing. And we believe that even when some of us say, oh, well, you know what? God is a loving God. And so at the end of time, when we stand there in front of the judgment seat, he's just going to let everybody in because he is full of such love. God is full of so much love that that's why he sent Jesus Christ to pay for us so that we could get into heaven. But the work won't get us there. Don't believe the signs. Our bite, our bite does not make you free. Work does not get you there. You can't be good enough because we all fall short of the glory of God. Well, not only does God do this thing, this incredible thing for us of give us peace, and, and what is it? It's this relationship that he's given to us. That's the peace. But then also, God gives us access. So he justifies us, taken care of. He gives us peace, means he glues us back to him. He pulls us back together. But he also gives us this gift of access. What is access? Well, do you remember the story of Queen Esther? She had been given the privilege of becoming one of the queen's And of Persia, and unknown to her, there were some people who did not like the Jews in the country, and they tried to do something to have the Jews killed off. And her uncle Mordecai comes to her and says, Esther, do you realize that you have may, be, may have become queen of Persia for such a time as this? that God put you into this position for this very purpose and for this very time to save your people. And what does Mordecai want her to do? Mordecai wants her to go into the king and plead on behalf of the Jews. Now here's the challenge, that in Persia, the rule and the law of the Medes and the Persians was that if anyone went into the king uninvited, the king could have them killed immediately. But there was this other little, just little small caveat to that law, that rule as well. Also, rule of the Medes and the Persians, and those rules could not be broken, was that if the king welcomed that person, then they weren't killed. So, so Queen Esther takes three days to fast. Now, we don't know what she was doing. I heard one commentary say that she was preparing her hair all that time. And I, please, I, I, I read that. I'm not saying that, okay? But, but we do know that she was pretty attractive when she walked in there and she had herself prepared so that she drew the attention of the king. But what we really believe that she was doing, because she had asked, she had asked this, she says, Mordecai, please ask the people to fast and what? And pray. And we're going to take three days and then I'm going in to see whether I live or die. And frankly, she did not know what would happen. You see, since she's one of many, even though, yes, he liked her, since she's one of many, it's easy to get rid of a queen. 
And so Esther prepares to go in. And after those three days of prayers, goes in to see the king uninvited. The king sees her and amazingly welcomes her. And then will break and set the Jews free from this law that's going to try to have them killed. God gives us that kind of access. This is incredible, isn't it? God gives us access into the throne room. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, and notice how Jesus said it. I haven't asked you to pray in my name before, but now he says to his disciples, pray in the name of Jesus Christ and you will be heard, you will receive, you will be listened to. You have access to the throne room of God himself because of this gift of Jesus Christ. But not only does God give us access, and and maybe it's because he gives us access that he gives us the gift of hope. Oh my. How many people will commit suicide during this holiday season? How many people will look to some type of Christmas celebration with dread? How many homes will break up during this season? How many marriages will end in divorce? How many people will literally die? because of a loss of hope during this season. You see, the unfortunate thing is is that a holiday, especially like Christmas, accentuates your relationships or the challenges in your relationships. It accentuates your pain. It accentuates loneliness and discouragement and despair. And so there will be people who will feel that there is no hope for them and that the only thing they can do to get past the pain is to take their own life. There will be people that will be thinking about going to a family gathering and they'll be dreading every moment of it because they'll be with people that don't like them, that are strangers to them. But because they're family, they have to get together. And they don't have any hope that there's going to be a sense of joy or peace or love as they gather. And so they do it out of dread and it makes it even more painful. Christmas and God's gift is about hope and it's hope for the future. It's it's about what God's going to do for us and the fact that even at the end of time, we have hope because of what God has for us and we can be confident in expecting that that God is going to work things out in the end for us because he cares about us. J.B. Phillips in talking about this said it's He said, it's a happy certainty that God is going to give us joy and hope. God wants to give us literally the reason for life. And no matter how difficult your circumstances might be, God is trying to let you know that he loves you so much that he is there for you. And he wants to give you hope, even for that bad family situation, even for that sense of depression that you might be facing. And the world out there needs to know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. I guess as I kind of wrap up this morning's message, my question for you is, what are we doing with God's gifts? What are you doing with the gifts that God has given to you? (laughs) <laughs> Are you like the child who threw the toy away and is playing with the box? Or have you already broken the toy and forgotten about it? What are you doing with the gifts that God has given to you? God has justified you. If you've said yes to Jesus dying on that cross, if you've accepted his payment for you, I didn't say if you were perfect, if you accepted then you have already been justified. What are you doing with that? What are you doing with the peace, this relationship that you have with God? Are you sharing that relationship with those significant people in your life, your oikos, the people that are part of your household, your community, those that you love and know and care about? Are you sharing your love, your peace with them as well? What are you doing with this access that you have? For such a time as this, you are alive right now. It's, it's Daryl's aunt. Oh, by the way, I forgot this one, Daryl. 
It's Daryl's aunt who's in a uh, nursing facility right now. And as we were talking about this, and she just went through another medical treatment, and she's been going through some tough stuff and all. But she said, you know what, Bill? I think I'm in this home right now for a purpose. I'm here with other people to share God with them. You think about that. Somebody that's in a nursing home means that they're with people who are at the last maybe days, weeks, months, or hours of their life. They are within moments of facing their eternal God. And how many of them are ready for that? And so here she is, even though she's struggling herself and hurting herself, not hurting herself, but hurting, okay? Got that clear? Even though she is hurting, she's realizing that there's purpose for her life right now with whatever breath she has left. What about you? What are you doing with the access you have to God? This privilege that you have to go into the throne room of God, what are you doing with that access? Are you taking the time to pray about the people that are around you? Do you care? And what are you doing finally with this gift of hope that you have? If somebody looks at you, would they have reason to ask you, why are you hopeful? Or would they look at you and say, you know, I'm going to pray for you. Don't believe in God, but I'm going to pray for you because you look so sad. What would people see as they look in your eyes? Because you see, you can be hurting in the deepest of pain and still have hope. Oh, I still remember standing there at Cody's funeral. And it hurt. Eight and a half years old, our nephew. And it, and, it, and it hurt because we'd watched him go through his final heart surgery. And we'd heard the doctors say that it was a success. And he was now going to be able to live with basically a normal heart. After eight and a half years of numerous surgeries, rebuilding of a heart, the whole process. But he couldn't heal from the final surgery. And so we stood there and had a rope on the um, table because it was his favorite toy. A rope. (laughs) Cheap thing that I think Mike pulled out of the garage, but it was his favorite toy. And it hurt to say goodbye to Cody. And it hurts his parents. I mean, they still, years later, they remember that pain. But the fact was is that we had hope. And there was this goofy little thing that happened as we're standing there at the graveside. We had brought balloons, and we released the balloons. Big bunch of balloons. And you know what? Okay, this, is, uh, this was just something cool. Maybe God, too. But as all those balloons were going up into the air, we're standing there just watching and tears flowing down our cheeks. We're watching. One balloon separates from all the others. Okay, folks, I I know that it's just the balloons. But for us, it was kind of an image of what God was doing that day. As one went ahead of the rest of us, Young though he was, he was taking his journey a little faster than the rest of us. And he was heading on up to heaven. And, and I say, you can make whatever you want to out of that. And I don't want to over-theologize that. But in that moment, it helped us remember that, yes, Cody had gone on ahead. And our hope, our great hope that we look forward to is we're going to see Cody again. And we're going to see Jesus. And we're going to be reunited with them and others face to face. You see, Christmas is about God's gift. God's gift that justifies us, that gives us this new renewed relationship, peace. He gives us access to him and hope that can carry us through the even painful moments. What are you doing with his gift?
And if you've never received that gift, I invite you to do it today. So how do I do it, Bill? I'm sorry, it's really simple. Say yes. Speak right there from your heart to God who's listening to you. If you feel the tug and he's saying, I want you to believe in me finally. I, I want you to know I've given you an opportunity for relationship. Say yes. And do it. Tell him yes. But also, before you leave here today, tell somebody, hey, I don't know who you are, but I said yes today. <laughs> tell somebody. And when you go out there, if you're really going to open up your Christmas present this year, tell somebody about this gift that God's offering to them. What are you doing with the gift?